Well, hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to today's Research America uh, Alliance discussion. I'm Bart Gordon, your moderator. And for the next several weeks, we'll be hosting Alliance discussions featuring some of our honorees of our 19, or rather our 2024 Advocacy Awards. And as a Research America board member, I am very excited today to introduce our special guest, Dr. or rather Mr. Norman Augustine, recipient of Research America's 2024 Herbert Perdiz Family Award for National uh, Leadership and Advocacy. And Norm, I want to take a quick moment for, it would take too long to introduce you. So let me just say that I have sincerely long admired you for your intellect, your wonderful sense of humor, as well as your longtime commitment to uh, American competitiveness through research, education, science, and innovation. Uh, you are really a champ. And I was going to suggest to Mary Woolley that we nominate you for the National Medal of te Technology and Innovation. But then I realized you got that 25 years ago. <laughs> so plus every other award that there is. It, and so I'm glad now that the Parties Award can um, sort of round out your um, trophy case. Um, and before we get started, let me remind everyone that at, at, that if you wanna pose a question to Norm, you can put it in the question and answer box or the chat box and we'll try to get to those at the end. Okay, so Norm, let's get going here. You okay, have been... <laughs> I look forward, I look forward to visiting and uh, it, uh, it would be hard to name anyone uh, who has done more for science and technology than yourself. So uh, it's an honor to be here with you. Well, it's a passion for both of us. Well, you have been a force behind every major piece of recent legislation intended to bolster our nation's science and technology capacity, including the American Competes Act and the CHIPS and Science Act. So how did you become such a, a forceful advocate uh, for science and technology? Well, Bart, it uh, goes back to uh, when I retired from my day job a little over 25 years ago now. And I got wondering what I could do with the rest of my runway that uh, might make a little difference. And uh, I got thinking, uh, I'd seen a number of surveys around the world that asked people uh, what was the most important factor in their quality of life. And they said jobs uh, throughout the world. That was overwhelming. And to have a good job. And uh, that led me to think about some studies that I've seen, and I know you're familiar with a number of them, one of which received a Nobel Prize that shows that 85 percent of the growth in America's GDP or jobs uh, is attributable to just two fields, advancements in those two fields, uh, science and technology. And that persuaded me that science was awfully important. And then I got to thinking that uh, so you can't have science without good scientists or good researchers. And so uh, science, uh, the promotion of science or uh, research became uh, one of my two uh, factors that I emphasized. The other was the uh, improvement of K through 12 education in, in America, where it's sad to say there's a lot of room for improvement. Well, Lockheed Martin's loss was our gain. Uh, so thank you. And, and tell me, being CEO of a big company like that, uh, did it influence um, your advocacy? Yes, it did. Uh, we had, at the time I was there, about 82,000 engineers that worked for us and quite a number of scientists, uh, nowhere near that number. And uh, I'm an aerospace engineer. And so uh, I, in my career, I've had the chance to watch people, engineers, do some pretty amazing things. And yet I was always acutely aware that uh, Engineers uh, rearrange the bricks. I don't demean us in any way, but <laughs> the bricks are created by the scientists. And if the scientists aren't doing research, there's no bricks for engineers to build things. And uh, so uh, it became very apparent to me that we, uh, we needed to do a lot more in science. And furthermore, that industries, uh, since you asked about industry, particularly that industry's support of research has been declining for the last uh, 20, 30 years very seriously at a time of the booming importance of research. And uh, the reason for that is fairly straightforward. Uh, at the time I first went into the business world, uh, 
I, uh, the average shareholder in a firm, in a large firm in this country, held their shares eight years. Uh, today it's four months. And so the shareholders, the owners of the companies, don't want you investing in things that take 10 or 15 years to pay off, like research or like education. They want to know what you're going to do the next quarter. And as a result, companies have stopped investing in research. And that raises an important point. Uh, Bart, as you know, I'm a free enterprise guy from the word go. I believe strongly that free enterprise and this democracy is the part of our country. But I also realize that there are some things that the industry just can't or won't or shouldn't do. And some of those things will be of importance to the public, where the public is a beneficiary. And that's why I think it's so important that that government step in and be a major supporter, particularly in funding uh, of uh, science and basic research conducted in our universities and our government labs. Well, I've always felt that when, when the federal government makes investments in education and research, then that creates innovation. Innovation then creates, you know, new jobs and products, which then create uh, revenue for the government to then invest more education uh, and research. And it's, a, you know, we help ourselves with that cycle. I think that's exactly right. Now, you mentioned um, uh, jobs, you know, which we think of as economic security. And then there's national security. Uh, on the federal level, uh, I won't say that the Defense Department has a blank check by any means, but um, that's a very high priority uh, with uh, uh, government funding. S science and technology doesn't seem to be as a high a priority. How can we bring that together? Well, you make an awfully good and unfortunate point. And uh, I, I would I would say that and you're better aware of this than most anybody, but uh, the government support of uh, defense has actually been wavering considerably during the time I was CEO of a company. Uh, 40% of the people in the aerospace industry lost their job that were working in defense. And uh, if we'd be so much better off than research and in defense and so on if we could have consistency of, uh, of funding. But uh, I, I think the only path that uh, we've got to uh, uh, convince the public that research is important is that get the public to connect the benefits they receive with the products of research. And, well, I think of, uh, people love their uh, uh, Apple iPhone and uh, uh, Apple deserves a great deal of credit for the innovation that it uh, introduced. And on the other hand, it wasn't Apple that made the iPhone possible. Uh, it was scientists working in research labs 10, 20, 30 years ago that really uh, produced the, the bricks, if you will, that made the iPhone possible. And, the same thing that is true of GPS and of any number of other things that we all sort of take for granted. And one of the things we've got to do is for the public to relate the, uh, the work that goes on in a research laboratory to their personal lives. And today, I think a lot of the public doesn't do that. They sort of think, well, these things just happen. Well, you know, um, you have chaired a number of National Academy and other types of research programs. I've been on a couple of those with you. And you warn us that once the report is done, the work just begins. And uh, so give us some advice. I know you've walked the halls of Congress. You've been to the White House. When you're making your case to policymakers, what works and what's not so good? Well, that too is a terrific question. And uh, uh, once again, you're more familiar with this than I, but uh, not long ago, I checked what was the most recent uh, data on the number of scientists uh, in uh, the House and the Senate. Out of 535 members, there were, there were four what uh, would be termed as having their degree in, in science. And so... Wait, 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 does political science count? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've been very careful here, Bart. <laughs> 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 and so... Uh, Science doesn't have a built-in uh, interest group uh, within uh, the Congress other than people like yourself who realize that it's important. And uh, when I beat the halls of Congress, uh, I find that there are a few people that disagree when I point out the importance of science 
and research. Uh, that's not the problem. The problem is it's not number one on most of their lists. And uh, somehow uh, we need to get uh, more support built up uh, for science just by convincing the public that it's important. And there's uh, one lesson I really learned was that uh, being a, a, a sort of an outsider to the science community, I mean, I'm not a scientist, uh, is a great advantage. And uh, because uh, you're not viewed as having a, a personal interest other than that of a, the average citizen and the outcome of scientific work. And yet, uh, when I was able to speak about science, I was generally given a lot of credibility. Uh, uh, and if we could get more people from, who are not scientists to understand the importance of science and uh, go out and talk, uh, I had 182,000 people working in the company I was, was responsible for. And that somehow led people to believe that maybe I knew something about science, which I didn't. But it, it did suggest that uh, the impact uh, on jobs could be important. And so we need more governors and mayors and business people and doctors and lawyers and bankers out there talking about the importance of science. And for scientists to say it's important is also, it, it is important, but it doesn't have the impact that, uh, frankly, that many of these other folks have. And I should also say that uh, most of the efforts supporting science tend to be rather periodic with government budgets at this point. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's unfortunate. What we need is a uh, entities that have a lasting continuing understanding and support for science and research america is a classic example of the importance of, of that kind of uh, institution you know when i was first elected chairman of the science space and technology committee a reporter asked me what was my area of science i told him political science that uh i took the good ideas of folks like norm augustine and tried to you know get them implemented uh, <laughs> so uh, there's still more to be done, unfortunately. I, I hope maybe you'll consider running for re-election. <laughs> well, one, as chairman, I used to hear skeptics, science uh, research skeptics in Congress say things like, well, that'll, that'll crowd out our you know, federal investment will crowd out private investment. And also they would say, um, if there is a good idea that needs to be researched, then the private sector will do it because they'll make money on it. So what's your response to them? Gosh, I think you gave a great answer to that about five minutes ago. That is that uh, basic research uh, doesn't crowd out to industry investment. It, it increases investment. And it's for the very reason you cited that uh, it opens new pages in a book. It, it produces, uh, opens doors to new knowledge. And entrepreneurs uh, then take a hold of that knowledge and see opportunities to build companies. And uh, many, many companies in this country have been built by uh, people who took an idea that came out of a government lab. Uh, DARPA is a great example of that in the Defense Department, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, that have brought us things that have changed everybody's life for the better. And uh, so my argument is that uh, government investment is highly leveraged in terms of getting uh, the private sector to invest more. And uh, I, I think uh, it's the free enterprise system at work. Well, I think you addressed it somewhat earlier with your quarterly report type of, of comments that um, uh, private sector, you know, uh, the current kind of CEOs are looking you know, for the next quarter, where maybe former CEOs uh, could say to the stockholders, let's invest some now because it'll pay off dividends later. Hard to do that. So the federal government really has to do that early research to get things going and then turn it over to the entrepreneurs and they'll kick it kick it in, in high speed. I believe we've seen that too, Bart, where uh, industry is increasing its percentage of uh, development work in the country from like a third to over two thirds while the government share of research is uh, just barely hung on or declined. You know, and, and we're also seeing um, more women and minorities that are getting involved in the sciences. And that's, a, I think, a very good thing. And we have passed programs to try to accomplish that. But when you're talking to uh, policymakers, how do you convey the benefits of diversity 
in the science and technology, both research area and in the workforce? Mara, what I try to do is uh, point out that uh, we handicap ourselves greatly by having uh, uh, minorities and women so generally underrepresented in science and technology. And, uh, China has four times the population we do. 79% uh, uh, of the baccalaureate, baccalaureate degrees China awards are in STEM. In the U.S. it's 23%. And if it's in the, the physical sciences, the difference is even greater. And if China is going to have way more engineers and scientists than we are and do a lot more research than we do eventually, uh, the, the, we're just handicapping ourselves. And uh, it's kind of ironic. Uh, last time I checked, 59% of college bachelor's degrees go to women in this country. Uh, that's like one and a half uh, per, per man. And uh, it in many fields, law and medicine and so on, the women are about half or even a little more in some cases. But in science, we're way down. Uh, and it's a handicap we impose on ourselves. I guess a logical question, Bart, you probably ask, well, why do we do that? And uh, I think one thing is there are a lot of fathers that still tell their young daughters that girls don't do science or engineering. And uh, uh, that's a very unfortunate uh, statement. And uh, then there's the common thing for both men and women, and that is that our K-12 system, which, as I recall, has us ranked in international tests about 17th among nations in, in uh, math and 29th in science, I think it is, but nowhere near the top. And one of the reasons for that is that most of the high school graduates aren't qualified to even start a degree in, in science uh, because they skipped algebra or something uh, along the way. And so high on the priority of helping science is to fix the K through 12 system, particularly in science and engineering. You know, um, hopefully there are more role models now that people can see, uh, and that will encourage them. I know that when I was first elected to Congress, the first three people that I hired were the three guys that had worked with, on the campaign with me. And then I started hiring some women and some minorities, and, and they would say things when we would be discussing issues, like I would say, well, I didn't know that. I didn't think about it that way. And it made really the decision making uh, in my office, much better. And, and, and I think that's what we see now in research. It's collaboration. You know, it's like putting a plumber and a, and a, a bricklayer all together. You know, you, you, you get a better idea how to build a house. And when you have more diversity of thought, uh, you, I think you, you come up with better uh, solutions. So I hope that we can continue to see that kind of uh, increased diversity. No, no, another a uh, related aspect, Mark, is the, uh, the number of international students uh, in science and engineering in this country. Uh, students who were born elsewhere came to America usually for their advanced degrees and stayed here and built a career here, raised their families here. And uh, about 30% of America's science and technology workforce was born abroad. 38% uh, of our PhDs in the, uh, in the, in the sciences uh, uh, who were born abroad. And yet, and you know, you're very familiar with this, that we do an awful lot to make it hard for them to come here and make it even harder for them to stay here. And uh, on the grounds that parallel to our prior discussion that they force Americans out of the job market. But the fact is we need all the American born people in the job market we can, and we need uh, new Americans who come here uh, so much. and. Uh, uh, making it hard for them to come here and get their higher education is, is, is so harmful to us. You know, a few years ago, I gave the commencement uh, at Rensselaer, and so many of the PhD, uh, you could tell by their last names, you know, uh, were from another country. And most of them had to leave. They had to, they had to go back. And um, uh, I'll, you know, just... Uh, editorialize a, a little bit right now. Um, uh, there has been an effort for many years to say, if you get a PhD or a master's in an area that we need here, you should automatically have a, a visa to stay. 
uh, or, you know, if you have a job offer. Uh, but, you know, we haven't been able to get around uh, to do that, uh, un unfortunately. And uh, hopefully, as immigration is being discussed now, uh, that will be a, a part of it. Um, so I remember in 2007, there was an earnest young man who led the Rising Above the Gathering Storm uh, report that came and testified before the Science uh, Committee. And um, and what reminds me of that is that um, the State of Science in America report that the Science and Technology Action Committee just released today said 70% of the people we surveyed believe that children will be worse off in the future. And that earnest young man in 2007 sort of told us the same thing. So my question to that earnest young man is, how are we doing? You know, uh, you told us what we needed to do then. Uh, are we doing it? Are we not doing it? What else do we need to do? Well, in a word, uh, my answer to how are we doing is poorly. And uh, one of the reasons that uh, we find the, uh, ourselves in that situation is that we have a very short memory. Every now and then we get fired up. We had we the sputnik that woke us up and uh, uh, but that soon tapered off and uh, uh, various other efforts that have come up uh, that uh, with time uh, we get distracted by other legitimate problems. But in this world, you got to be able to deal with more than one problem at a time. And uh, government funding is a percentage of GDP uh, funding of research it now ranks the United States as 29th in the world. And uh, if you want to be number one in the world in research, uh, particularly compared with your size, uh, you can't afford to uh, be 29th in the world. If you take uh, biomedical research, which the public does support generally, and we spend uh, almost 19% of our GDP on healthcare, but about a tenth of a percent of the government's uh, budget, uh, should be a tenth of a percent of the GDP is devoted by the government to research into healthcare, and if it, the the ratio just just seems at least to me all out of whack, and that a much more investment in research would uh, save us money elsewhere. And so uh, the bottom line is that we're not investing very well, in my opinion, and uh, uh, we need to do better. I agree. Let me let me tell you another quick workforce sort of uh, discussion I had some years ago. This was after we really started pushing back, uh, uh, making our PhD students leave and that sort of thing. And the uh, the head of the Irish higher education system came to see me, and we were talking, and he said, "Well, he was happy about that because uh, students all around the world want to learn English. They wanted to come to America, uh, and so now they're going to Ireland." Uh, or Canada, so they can um, get that education and they'll stay there and build up their economy. So uh, that's one more part of the solution. So speaking of these young career scientists and engineers out there, what would be some Augustine laws that you would cite them? Well, thank you for uh, plugging my book, which I wrote, uh, believe it or not, 50 years ago. And <laughs> You'll get a check every quarter. It's in six different languages. And I will tell you very privately that I wouldn't want to live on that check. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my my advice uh, to a young graduate, and it's, it's going to sound uh, kind of contrarian when I say it, but uh, is don't try to get ahead. Uh, just do your job. Uh, three words, do your job. And the people I've known uh, who were focused on getting ahead, how do I get that next step of the ladder? How do I get there? Usually fall off the ladder somewhere. And those who do their job the best they know how to do it, they get noticed. And the people who help other people do their job the best that they can help, they do get noticed. And so uh, my advice is uh, do your job. And I I've been saying that for many years, and I noticed that there are a lot of other people, including some football player, football coaches, who give that same advice. You know, oddly, uh, that's what I tell people too. And whatever success that I've had, it was because I did a good job at the job I had, and then 
was recognized. So I could take the next one and the next one. So many people, you know, whether it's show up for work or be serious, they're just not. And if you are, let's just say a manager, you're looking for folks that will show up and do a good job. And then you'll help to elevate them. Um, and you don't, you know, my wife complains about the millenniums. They think they, they're supposed to be vice president, you know, the, the second week and then president the next month. Uh, sometimes it takes a while. Well, it, you, using your life as an example, uh, your career, uh, might be, although as great as it was, it might have been greater if you didn't decide to focus on things like science and technology that are not number one issues with the nation. Uh, if you've gone on the Social Security Committee or something like that, uh, you took on the hard work that's in the back room, but boy, so important, and I thank you for it. Well, it was, it was fun. So let's um, let's see, uh, Jacqueline, do we have some questions from the audience? Yes, thank you, Congressman Gordon, and thank you, Mr. Augustine. It's been a wonderful discussion so far, I'm sure all our audience members agree. So I believe we only have, oh, we'll start with this first question. Absent a second Sputnik moment, we instead face multilateral threats and the ambiguity of a pacing threat from one of our key trading partners. In this environment, do you feel sanguine about the scale of investment and state of our national R&D enterprise? Well, it's a profound question and unfortunately it's not an easy one to answer. Uh, and I think one of the things that's striking today uh, in the past, uh, we've had existential questions since time zero, I guess, but, uh, excuse me, I got a phone to where I'll shut that off. Uh, the, uh, since time zero, uh, Just tell the we, president you're calling back, uh, Norm. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I better take it. The, uh, anyway, since time zero, we've had them, but seldom we had so many. Uh, today, we've got issues of underinvestment, in K-12 K K education, underinvestment in research, uh, climate change, uh, China, you cite, uh, nuclear proliferation, uh, federal debt, pandemics, and so on down the line. And... Uh, the, uh, the the need to focus on uh, each of those is so important. And uh, it's just my belief that uh, uh, we're not doing an adequate job. Uh, I get hope from the fact that uh, we've risen to the occasion in the past. And I think in my own field, uh, aerospace engineering, uh, in World War II, with a totally unprepared to go into the war, almost totally, uh, I was a very young man at the time, and uh, uh, we had uh, a GDP of about 11% of what today's GDP is in real purchasing power. And somehow within uh, four years, we were building 100,000 airplanes a year. Uh, we can do it. Uh, we just have to get focused. And uh, I always like to say that uh, uh, a pessimist is a person who wants to be an optimist, but has a knowledge of the facts. And I think that's kind of where I am at this point in time. I, factually, I think we've got a real problem uh, in terms of uh, my optimism. I, it's inherent in me. Jacqueline, ask him a hard one. Hard one. <laughs> well, we have another one that came in in the chat here. Um, so... Uh, this reader just read Musk by Walter Isaacson. He and his initiative seem to represent a different model for initiating paradigm changes in areas like transportation and communication. What are your thoughts? Well, I'm a great fan of Walter Isaacson and his, his writing. And uh, uh, change, unfortunately, in this country tends to come about when there's been a crisis or uh, something uh, very profound. And, uh, as you, we, of course, uh, saw things like the Ch Chips and Science Act, and uh, which I think was extremely important, both for chips and science. But there's a profound difference between the way the two were handled. Uh, chips, uh, we, the people who were, who were going to implement that were given a check, uh, whereas the science, which uh, it's a great step forward, but it wasn't a check. It was an invitation to come back every year and ask for money. And uh, 
it does reflect a change in the attitude of the, of the Congress and the administration, which is, is terrific. But uh, uh, I think if we're going to solve the transportation problem in this country and, uh, and really the uh, infrastructure problem writ large, uh, I hope we can do it short of a, of a crisis. And uh, uh, past history suggests that's hard for us to do. Well, Norm, this has been a quick 30 minutes. Um, let me uh, thank the audience. Uh, also looking forward to uh, the, the award ceremony with you on March the 13th, 24. And before we lose our audience, let me make another announcement that um, our next Alliance discussion will be Tuesday, December the 12th at 2.30 for a conversation with Dr. Selene Grouder, uh, Senior Fellow and Editor uh, at Large for the Public Health um, and, and Health News and the winner of Research America's 2024 Isidore Rosenfeld Award for Impact on Public Opinion uh, Awards. So a link to register is in the chat line. You can, you can uh, uh, sign up now. Hope you will. And thank you for joining us. And good to see you again, Norm. Thank <laughs> <You're> you. <special. laughs>